welcome back friends let us move on to our next technical session to enlighten us in this session we have invited a brilliant chartered accountant ca ds vivek may I request her ca jain kumar to escort him on the dais and also welcome him to the floor of okay. the Please welcome. Thank you, Jay Kumar sir. As I mentioned, a uh, brilliant chart accountant, uh, DS Vivek, executive director, both in the uh, CA final and the uh, CA inter also. DS Vivek is a business catalyst. Entrepreneur, coach, trusted advisor, speaker, and out of the box thinker. Managing partner at Suresh and Co. Chartered Accountants, Bangalore. Prior to that, he was tax consultant uh, with the Price Waterhouse Coopers, advising businesses around the world for 21 plus years. Passionate about creating simple and holistic solutions, addressing businesses, commercial tax and regulatory requirements. He is known for achieving commercial efficiency without compromising corporate governance. He has every interest in the game of life. CADS Vivek has also presented important papers on direct taxes uh, at various uh, forums including ICAR, KCAA and uh, in many public sector undertakings. His other significant achievements are <coughs> he was involved in publication of ICA titled Create Car and Career, the essential roadmap for young practitioners, co-author for digital commerce and analysis of taxation. He was co-author of International Taxation Practice Concept Dividends by Group Dynamics. He was co-opted member of NDAS. Implementation Committee of ICI during the year 2014-15. He has completed IFRS certification course conducted by ICI. His vision is to be an inspiration for the entrepreneur community to also spearhead his firm Suresh and Co into becoming one of the top most firms in the world. With this brief intro, I present CA DS Green before you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Good evening to all of you. I think we need more energy in this room. It's a cold weather out there. So happy evening. Thanks, Mr. P.T. Shetty, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, as you said, that uh, I'm more of an entrepreneur, more of a, a business catalyst. So what I do is I just bring in ideas and then start pushing those ideas. Actually don't push it. I just bring those ideas, bring those paths and then see how those paths develop and those ideas get stimulated if it grows. So it may not be that, I may not know the taxation provisions of the sections, I may not know, but I do know the concept of taxation well, not the concept of business and how business is done. And that is the way we will go through this also. Uh, so basically the whole way we will take through you is that going by the heading of Vitwat Sabha which just talks about that sharing one's knowledge in a Sabha. I am not going to teach you anything but I am just going to share my experience with you. And in that experience is where the practical issues in, in planning for capital gains. It's basically the entire thing is on practical issues. That is what it is. Oh, so I would not even go into what a financial instrument is. You all know what financial instrument is, the stocks, shares, the bonds, even cash, it's all the financial instruments. So that is where it is and if you actually get into the depth of it, I started looking at it, it's a maze to get into it. Even just to find out whether it's a long term or a short term, I just can't answer it. Somebody calls up and says, well, I am selling the share, whether it's long term, short term, I said please hold on. 
I will call somebody with this kind of a chart and then you tell me, okay, you tell me now whether it's a listed share, unlisted share, what is it, who is selling it. So that is a complex system that is there. So for getting into it, these kind of charts are helpful. Have a chart, then whenever there is a question, just get into this chart and then figure out what is long term, short term, what is the rate. Even the rates are not common. It goes from right from 5% to 30% is the tax rate that goes on or the slab rate. That is how it is. So that's a complex maze on that. What are the, that is the basics of the taxation that is there. So, but what I would like to talk about is whenever you are talking about advisory on a transaction that is happening, when somebody has sold an investment, is that the time when you get into it? When you start advising a client on this transaction, when somebody has sold it, sold some investment, do you advise? When he is when he is planning to sell, okay. So actually, I advise when they are planning to invest. So that is the thing that has to go into because once an investment is done, that is not possible to change. For example, I heard somebody saying that from a house property, they are showing in the wife name, they are showing the rental and the sale. They want to show that. See, because at that was a decision taken at the investment time. At the investment time, whatever decision was taken, that continues to the entire history. So that's very important, right? At the investment time, and the, the planning is there to do with the investment. Right from that time, the advisory for a investment transaction needs to be done. And it so happens that I would just want to take you through something which is happening in the last one week as an example. A lot of things do happen in our office. So one transaction which is happening now. I don't even know if I open my mobile and then look at my WhatsApp, some more queries might have come. But what has happened is where it is. And the way it's going to put across, <coughs> I'm just going to take you this entire transaction and you can see where all we have faulted on those transactions, what it is. Just a, around last Monday, a call came, somebody told that I want to introduce you to a client. He's selling a shares, he wants advice on capital gain. I said, fantastic. Can you help it out? Oh, very much. You can help them out. Uh, sale of shares and we have to just tell you what is the capital gain. That's all. Yes. Mm -hmm. Next day, Tuesday, the client calls up. He calls on a WhatsApp, not on a regular number. Mm -hmm. Guy with an Indian name. He calls up and he says, yes, I am selling shares. And I want you to, okay, I should advise. I said, okay, I will advise you. This might be the taxation rate. It would be, for half 20% would be, if you, how much you have already hold it? No, long time back. More than two years? Yes. 10 20 percent is the tax. No, no, somebody told 10%. I said, no, no, it's not possible. It is 20%, I know the law. Then, uh, suddenly, somewhere I felt that, then he said, I am selling those shares, and the buyer, he is somebody from the US, and they want to know whether the treaty provisions are applicable. I said, the name, so an Indian name, somebody said that, he is an Indian name, right? Because I did not ask him, first question I should ask him is that, whether you are a, just because he comes with an Indian name called Vivek, doesn't mean that he is a, Resident. So I did not ask my question. First question I need to ask him is that what is it? He said I am staying in Singapore. Oh, okay. So he is a non-resident. Immediately then I said the tax rate is 10 percent because you are a non-resident. Next again we said that oh you again so you are in Singapore. So if you are in Singapore, then there is a possibility that you don't have to pay tax at all on this. So because there is a treaty involved now. It is not just the domestic tax law. There is a treaty involved, and when we said there is a taxability on it, but with experience, I have got a lot of grey hair, so experience says that, don't answer immediately. Two things, don't answer immediately because if you answer immediately, I can't charge them. Second is, I need to do a proper homework and then answer. So he said, okay, we will look into it and get back. Prima facie, it may appear that there is no tax, but we need to look at it. And just ask him when he purchased it, because Singapore treaty says that he should have bought it before 2000. 14 or something like that, I don't exactly remember that. Uh, before that, then they get a treaty benefit. Uh, then as when he bought the chair, what was he? He said, I was a resident in India when I acquired it. Later on, I moved to Singapore. Oh, my started confusion now. I always know a Singapore person investing, when money bringing in, not there, not there. This fellow says he's an Indian resident, and then he moved out on employment there. So, I thought maybe he has heard somebody that I you normally advise people to go away from India to Singapore before they sell the tax. So I thought that's where he has done. But I still need to do my homework. Then went through the treaty and then looking at it, 
the treaty very clearly says that a Singapore resident selling the shares in India that it's taxable in Singapore, not in India. Good. Then doesn't talk about whether he should have been from India, he should have gone out, all that, that confusion also went out for me. The law doesn't say, looked into the various discussions, judicial decisions everywhere, nobody talks about he moving now. Of course, there is also something called a law of limitation, where they are told that if a person has arranged his life in such a way, just to get a treaty benefit he has arranged his life, that means he has moved from India to Singapore, just to take the treaty benefit, then he is not entitled for the treaty benefit. So went through his appointment letters, asked him how did work, how did you change, what it is. He was working on company, therefore he, they made him move. It was not his decision, his company's decision to make him move. So that I have a documentary evidence now that he has not moved on his own. will see, these are intentions. I need documentary evidence when I to fight it. Just he telling me is not sufficient. So his employment, his email communication showed that yes, it has been moved to Singapore. That is there. So we told him that that also matters. Right? Then there is a condition which says that, some of the conditions say, the elimination clause says that the benef any benefits or exemptions given under the treaty is applicable if that income is received in Singapore. So we suggested to him that you will get the benefit but you need to receive in Singapore, the buyer is some your US person, so ask him to pay it in uh, Singapore. But before we told him that, we also said that he was, see, we just, this is where the important is that you don't know only one law. You need to know multiple laws. FEMA is something very important. When he bought, he was a resident. We know the conversation. So checked up the FEMA. Then FEMA said when a person has bought it on a non repetitive basis when he was resident, has moved out, then the money should come to India. Money should come to India. So money should come to India is what it is. Then just for the sake of understanding what is the surcharge, I asked him, is your transaction value what is your transaction? Yes, it is a new guy, don't, they don't disclose things. I asked him, is it above 5 crores? He said, yes, it is above 5 crores. So when he said above 5 crores, then I said, no problem. The money can come to, then I said that, the money should come to the NRO account and immediately that money should go to Singapore for you to get a zero tax benefit because the law says income should go there. He then, he comes and says, he asked me what is the limit for money to be going to Singapore. I said, 1 million dollar. He said, no, no, my transaction value is much more than 1 million. It is around 2 million, more than 2 million. Then again, problem, I can't send the money above 2 million, In I can't do it, there's a problem there. So next suggestion we again brainstorm, then said that, okay, FEMA wants the money to come to an NARO account, income tax wants the money to go to Singapore. So instead of money coming here and then going, they said let the money go to Singapore account and from there the money let it come to India account immediately. FEMA is a lesser probably, the intention of FEMA is to bring the money to uh, Singapore, uh, to India. So we said, suggested that and said escrow account and all that. But the uh, buyer refused us it. He said, as per FEMA, I need to pay only to India account. So again, went back to research some more. Luckily, there are some judicial decisions, tribunal decisions. We all know how tribunal decisions come. Uh, something may be correct, something may not be correct. Tribunal decision says that to get the TT benefit, money need not go to Singapore. So he said, you are taking a risk. I would want the money to go to Singapore, but even if it doesn't go, plan it over a period of one year, two years, let it go. But right now, based on the judicial tribunal decision says that even if the money can come to India, that is good enough, it does not go to, so we'll take the trade tax benefit. So based on that, we started preparing our more, saying that it's entitled for this. And then 195 would come in because he is a non-resident, buyer is a non-resident, TDS has to be done. Now when TDS has to be done, next issue, whether it's on the income or on the gross value, on what it is. Whenever I represent the buyer, I say it is on the gross value. Whenever I represent the seller, I say it's on the net value. Because as I was saying that we should be very abundant caution today because the wordings are not so clear. If you go into that word, it is just not clear and there are certain circulars which has come and said that the, where in case of a DP holder, where there is a repository, has the details of both the buy cost, sell cost, everything is there. In those cases, the law has allowed them to do it on a net value because they have all the data. In other cases, and including going by the uh, G uh, Supreme Court, G's case, where everybody has said that when there is an income and they are not able to determine what is the income, it will go and apply for the assing officer to get a certificate. So we said it should be the gross value, but of course I was from the seller side, 
instead of the net value, convince that child also for a gross value, uh, for the net value. Um, they did not everything over, but they said they said that they said they are not going to give the TT benefit because he has signed off the tax deduction would be done without giving TT benefit. They were aggressive. The big lawyers on the other side they want to play very cautious. The scientists so that was they are they are not giving the TT benefit in spite of all being having all the thing. So, but he also accepted it. We said TT benefit is over. Everything got over. Suddenly sitting in a tribunal, messages start coming. Is they said that. Uh, you have not talked about 50 CA. See, this fellow bought at 350,000 rupees and is getting 2 million rupees, that is around 14 crores. Will I think 50 CA will be applicable? Now they wouldn't think of that. Not applicable. 350, though, that is there, definitely fair value and much more than book value. But no, the problem is 50 CA can come any time. The problem there is, I'll take you through it later, if your number of preference shares are more, and equity shares are less. The way the formula works is net worth divided by equity shares only has to be done. They don't consider the preference shares at all for this. This is a problem in the formula. So based on that, a 50 CA came up and then the buyer said, I will deduct TDS on 50 CA value, not on the transaction value. And we said, no, you can't do it. Again, go by it. 50 C transactions were there where the tribunal has decided it is only on the the wording itself says on the amount paid as credited or paid in cash, etc. Credited, you cannot credit 50 CA value. If you credit it, I am okay to take it. That's not a problem. Uh, but so credited, paid everything, that will not come in. And then again, I have to convince them that do it on the gross bond data because the reason was I had accepted to go for net. Net income means 50 CA value comes in. But if it was on gross, 50 CA doesn't come in because they sold the sum. So it's very important how to think through when before we put our head. So immediately I was able to shift it and said, okay, let us do on gross. They also accepted that they will not deduct from 50 CA, they will do on this. Um, calculations had to come. They sent across a document. Apart from this 2 million, there was another 1 million, which is called a deferred consideration to be paid for this transaction. Mm -hmm. Issue is now they want to do even on the deferred consideration, not on the so again we look at it, important when you look at the, these transactions, you look into it. Capital gain talks about, as I said, there is an arising of the transfer. First, it is on the transfer of a particular instrument. If it is a share, when it is a uh, capital gain appears, when there is a transfer. So the transfer is happening this year, yes. What is the amount? Any amount relating to this transfer is to be taxed. So today, 2 million I know is there, 1 million is contingent. Something should happen in this company, company should grow well, something else have happen, or all money should become PM, something like that contingent is there. So based on that, you will get the additional 1 crore. So we said that, that event has not happened for it to arise. Therefore, today, the taxable amount is only the 2 million, not the additional 1 million. And even 195 talks about what is being paid, etc. They able to convince them. And I told them that whenever you give, the 1 million to be at that time. That time we do the withholding tax and I will find a revised return for this making it 3 million. That is what we will do it. So this issue also happened on to this. So if you look at this, it took around 1 week's time for us to just close a simple matter of taxing on capital gains on a sale of shares. This is the type of complications that would be there in a transaction and you need to be very fast. You should know things that are happening. In between, they talked about an indemnity clause, etc. There we said no bank guarantee, we have to fight it out and all that. Of course, as of now, that is happening, whether the bank guarantee will be given or no, whether it's a seven year bank guarantee or a one year. I'm talking about a one year bank guarantee. The reason is that from a TDS perspective, the moment the recipient files his tax returns, the demand who, who has been TDS uh, default assessee will stop the moment the Seller files a tax return. Therefore, a bank guarantee or indemnity can be given only for one year from today, not for seven years. Because this default will stop. So we have to look into all these aspects of it, not just the taxation aspect. We need to look into the TDS aspect, the 50 CA aspect, when will up to when assessments can happen, what it is. This is the way the advisory happens. So it's very important that how we start off the discussion with the client is the communication that we have should be very, very important for us. If we are not convenient, uh, 
communicating enough, we are not asking the right questions, not getting the right documentation, then we can, for a lot of things we can mess it up. So it's very important for that and when we are looking at it, that's very important that from a pricing point of view, it's very important is that do not accept a fixed fee with your client for any transaction. Tell them that let's work on a time based model. I do not know, I'm just getting into it, especially pre-transaction, time based. End of the day, what is it? So today we have given him a value of approximately we have given him his tax benefits or more than five to six crores of tax benefit we have given him. And our fees is only 60,000 rupees. Because I'm a time based, I'm not going by the value based. We have just paid down for last, so we don't want to get it. So, but, but at least I'm sure protected there. So that's important that get into a time based advisory services to your client, very important. Collect documentation, ask questions, and it's important that we had, I overall what we looked at it, we said that we jumped the gun of not looking at 50 CM, which created a lot of problems later on. So it's important that we need to have a checklist prepared before we advise. These are the things that we have to ask this question. Are you or not this question? Is there a book value more than that? What's happening? If is there a consideration is only this, get me the document, I want to see the document and then advise you on that. These are things here we did over as and when things came on, we started doing it. But the better way for us is that first two days don't do anything, collect all the information, collect information, information, everything, compile it, we had a checklist, compile it off, then start working upon it. That way it would have been a much better way. So though it sounds exciting, but the process that we had followed was wrong. So I just want to keep you both the practical aspect as well as the planning aspect on that. Both I am plugging into that and leaving it. <coughs> right from the investment stage, I told you the planning needs to be done right from the investment stage. One needs to look at whether when a company is raising money, should it be all financial instruments, should it be debt or should it be a capital? Debt is always cheaper because debt you can book the interest, pay the interest and it is tax deductible. Dividend you know is non-tax deductible. So what do you do, when what do you do is very important. It also depends upon from which country that investor is coming from. What are US status? For some countries interest is taxed at a very low rate. So here you get a 30% deduction, interest is taxed at 5% in that country. So it is, makes very much sense to take it as a, as a debt. But if you want to take it as a debt, there are thin capitalization rules that you need to look into it. In, within India, they say that the maximum 30% of EBITDA is what can be paid as debt. Those rules are there. So you need to look into that. So therefore, when there is a confusion, then you look into something called as a hybrid. There are convertible debentures or a redeemable preference shares. So in case of a redeemable preference shares, it is equity. If you look into your cap, cap table, it is as equity. But you have to pay it back to them. So it is like a Debt, but when you declare the coupon rate on that is non deductible. So when do you use it? There are some companies, you know, there are a lot of startups, you know, that I don't know, Amazon, Flipkart, Uber, and all, I don't know when they will complete their eight years of losses. It looks pretty long time. So by now, their last ninth year, tenth year losses are all getting over. Uh, it's not available. So what we do, anyway, the losses are not useful. So at least do it as redeemable preference, yes, and then give it as a Student money would go out because you don't require those uh, losses are anyway not required. If you book interest, the losses just goes up. So therefore, they are also not worried about that. Uh, you show higher income, use the cash flow losses, and then close it. And at the end of the time, money can go out. So minimum preference is money can go out. That's where we need to use it. These are called as uh, the concept is called as tax exhausted companies. This, their losses are so huge, doesn't matter for them what expenses they are <laughs> And then uh, also there's a concept called exchangeable bonds. So I need money now. I, basically I need the money but somebody is interested in uh, buying the shares I have invested in a subsidy or a business line I have invested and he wants to buy it and I need money now. So rather than selling it off today, I can go for something called an exchangeable bond and there's an option to the person who has given the money that whenever he wants, he accepts the right to buy the shares of my subsidiary at the price that we have already agreed upon. So in this way what happens, I am able to get the money at the same time not pay the taxes today and I am postponing the 
tax on this brand. Of course, that also needs to be looked at it from this angle when he wants to sell it long term, short term. The 50 CA value would have gone up from today to two years down the line, the value might have gone up. Those things also need to be looked at it, but these kind of bonds called an exchangeable bonds can be talked about and then do that. So, as talking about bonds, there are this uh, specified zero open bonds is the investment that can be done. See, whenever you invest in a, a fixed deposit, you get say 8% interest every year. Every year getting 8%, then you have to pay taxes also every year on that. Or even if it is a accumulated uh, fixed deposit, if you are following accrual basis, you need to pay taxes. Though you have not bought it, you need to pay taxes on it. There are something called zero coupon bonds, specified zero coupon bonds. Uh, NHAI, those companies give that. In zero coupon bonds, basically the law itself says that if you hold it for more than one year, it's a long term. Second is, at the time of maturity redemption, it is capital gain, not it is interest. Interest is taxable at 30 plus surcharge, 42.5% now. And uh, bonds are maximum rate is 26%. One year, capital gain is 26%. So you can go for a zero coupon bonds. Of course, there are also now zero coupon bonds should be specified and notified by the government. So what kind of other instruments are there? There is something called a structured bonds. The what they do structured bond is, these are not coming from the notified thing, but the benefit is something similar with a zero coupon bond you get. The structured bond is saying that you put in 10 lakhs now and they will say after 3 years, 3 months, because 3 years is the long term. So this always say 3 years, 3 months, 39 months uh, with this one. You will get, if the index is performing so much, you will get so much. If the index is performing so much, you will get so much. They link it to index. Otherwise, if nothing is happening, minimum I will give you 10% return. Maximum would be 40%, minimum is 10%. But as an investor, I am always looking at a minimum of 10%. Instead of getting it as an interest, if I get this as a structured bond, after 3 years, 39 months, 39 months, 38th, if I Allow in the 39 months for me to get back the money, the entire amount is interest I pay at the higher rate. So what I do, I identify market players in that, 38th month I sell this and book a capital gain. Because they are very close, they know what the NFT is, 10, 15 days before, you sell it and book it as a capital gain rather than as a, so you have two benefits, one is the tax rate is low, second is you have option for a long term capital gain to be invested in house property etc you have those benefits also. So this is how you go for a structured bond rather than a fixed deposit bond. Of course, there are risks associated with it. Um, we had invested quite a lot in ILFS. For me, being a child opponent, I thought ILFS was a government company. I don't know why. Uh, so invested, we lost the money. So it's a structured product. They will, you should be very careful. Similar like that is called IRR based bonds. IRR based bonds, they don't give a open rate. They say that, they say it's an IRR of 12%. That means if you get at the year end, you get 12%. But if you get after 2 years, the IRR is 12. 3 years, the IRR is 12 also. They based on that, they do that. Even that also, it will be treated as interest. But you can sell it just before maturity and you can treat it as a capital gain. So you can decide whether you want an interest income or a, a capital gain income. Somebody can also look at taking an interest income because at that particular point of time, you have got some set of what is there. You can look at it. So this is the the way you can plan around using bonds. Uh, please make it as interactive as possible. If there is any question, anything related to that, please ask, keep asking that, that the best way would be. <coughs> Once you have invested, most important is how do you withdraw money? One, we all know if I invested in a company, I can sell it and then do that. But there is a surplus money. Sell a company means it is a private owned company, my own company. How will I? I don't want to sell it, right? I'm a consulting company, I don't want to sell it, but still money is there in my company. What do I do? It? The best way is dividend payoff. But today dividend payoff has become so expensive. 20 plus surcharge, etc. Then in my hand, another 10% company has already paid and then it goes to 50% taxes goes off. So what do we do instead of dividend payoffs? What do we do? So we came across like buyback. It's not buyout, it is buyback. So buyback of shares. In a buyback of shares, at least we know that the earlier structure was for dividend, we used to do buyback. Then they said that you know, even on that you have to pay DBT. Instead of DBT, DBT has come, which is also around 20%. So, but still when you do a buyback, that additional 10% is not there, which is there for the dividend. 
so you will still stay. Second is in a buyback, say 100 rupees of dividend and 100 rupees of first tax. On 100 rupees of buyback, 100 minus cost of that equity, I get a benefit. So if my equity was 50 rupees, I have invested, I am getting at 100, then only 50 rupees suffers the tax of 20 rupees. So it's very important, you need to really look out for whether it should be, be dividend, whether it should be a buyback, etc. Uh, if the if I have got a subsidiary which has already paid dividend distribution tax and uh, got the money, that time I will not advise a buyback. I will because ATM or something is like that is there. I can just pass on the dividend back to the uh, ultimate shareholder and there's a knockoff of the dividends. So it should be factual. Everything we should know about what are things available and then look at it. <laughs> then to avoid this buyback, then we started when BPT came. Then we structured something called a selective capital reduction. You go to the court and tell the court. This excess money is there, no use. I return back to the shareholders and I give a selective capital reduction. I select only few shareholders and then give it out to them. Actually, I use it even for flushing out the minority stake. We use that. But even from a taxation, we can do that. Why is a capital reduction much better than a buyout? Your capital reduction on the gain, I need to pay 20% tax. Buyout also 20% tax. But why is this important? In this, in a, buy, in a buyback, for the recipient, 20% has already gone, but he doesn't have an option to invest in a property or anything and get a benefit. But in a capital reduction, he has a benefit of investing in a 54F uh, benefit he can take. Therefore, you can look at the 54F for a selective capital reduction. Instead of buyback, you can go for a capital reduction. But when you are doing this, one thing that should be careful is, this is basically you are transferring the shares in a buyout. The basically capital reduction one that needs to be looked at is whether 50 CA is applicable we need to see because it's also treated as a transfer. In a buyback, even if it is transfer, there is no taxation so it's okay. But in a capital reduction, we need to see 50 CA valuation also needs to be looked at it. Sounds attractive but still, if 50 CA is issued then again you need to change the uh, what you need to look at it. So entire stuff thing about this, there is no one solution for anything. A client walks in. Find out his problems and you need to tailor make that. Of course, there are a lot of learning that happens background and once you know about it, you know which one to put in, put, put one in. There is a box of solutions to decide which solution, which combination of solutions you want to put in. That's how you need to start putting in. Uh, sale of investments. Whenever somebody is asking you for sale of shares, first thing that what we tell them is, okay, they're selling the shares. Uh, then we say, do you have anything, any losses to be harvested? So what is losses to be harvested? Uh, that basically I look at, uh, do you have any other investments which are not doing well, which is already you have invested 10 lakhs to, it's normally not in lakhs, it's in crores. You have invested a crore, but the startup is gone, you have fetched only 1 lakh. So there's also a gain of 10 crores when it is there. You identify these kind of things with the other investments you have done and can it be sold at a loss book that loss and then in the same year so that your net gain is lesser. So always look at loss harvesting. This is like a checklist. Whenever somebody comes in, what all needs to be checked off is what we look at. It. And then we look at timing of the transaction. It's very important. Somebody comes and says in February, I'm selling the shares. It's as you said, it has to be before. After that, it becomes, we can't help it. We have to keep in touch with our clients. Somebody comes and says that I'm planning to, I'm looking for an investor to look at it. Then you say it starts in the month of December. Then you tell him, whenever the deal is coming close, please come and let me know. Comes in February and tells me that yes, the deal is happening now, the next 15 days. Tell him, can you push it to next year? Simple. Push it to next year, I get one more indexation. And not only that, instead of investment in 54F, I don't have to invest in July, I mean next to July. I have the money to play in the market and earn much more on that. So I need to do that. And then you can also look at booking some losses during the period. So the timing is very important when we look into our advising on that. Then we have something called a bonus tipping. Uh, how many of you have heard about bonus tipping? Okay, great. Let me just take you through this bonus tipping. I hope <coughs> this works, this extra sheets. <coughs>
So what is bonus tipping? The uh, what bonus tipping is nothing but you create artificial losses. You identify a blue chip company which is close to announcing bonus. One is to two, one is to one, something like that is there. And the concept is very simple. Suppose the somebody is coming with a one is to one bonus and the share is at 2000 rupees for one share. After the bonus, what would be the share value? 1000. So I sell the original shares which I bought at 2000, I sell it at 1000, I book a loss of 1000. Right? And I set it off against my capital gain which is being taxed at 26% or so. And the next year I wait for one year and then I sell my bonus shares and then I pay tax of 10% because it's a listed company bonus. I sell a tax at the first what I sold was unlisted, what I'm going to sell now is unlisted. I pay tax at 10% on that. So I beautifully make a arbitrage of that. Uh, so is that clean? Everybody agrees with me. This is a fantastic model. I book a loss, 2000 rupees, 1000 rupees, and then selling it. Is that fine? Are we making the same decision here? Is this, from a taxation, it looked very good. Is it the same decision? What do you say? How many say that this is a comfortable decision, everybody can do it? I would say no, because my expectation is that even after one year, I will get 1000 rupees. But stock market can go up, or if it goes up, I am really okay. But if it goes to 500, in the interest of greed of collect, saving on the tax amount, I will actually make a loss. I get into real loss. So what we do is, we do a hedging for that. And when we do a hedging, we should know that when we do a hedging, we should become business income and all that. So we do the hedging in a different tax file. If I have done the capital gain, I do the hedging in my father's name. And that hedging cost is around 4%. And also it is not the end of it. I should also calculate because if it's a one is to one bonus shares, my money is stuck in the 50% of my money is stuck in the market. So I'm not earning anything. If I'd earned anything post tax around one five percent, that's also there. So this is what this bonus tipping all about. So we have just done an illustration for you. If you want me, I can take you through it. I just did with a just look at the numbers. It's a five point five crore gain. On that, the tax rate is 28.5%. Uh, the tax payable is 1.56 crores. On the other hand, what we did was we invested in a 1 is to 2 bonus shares, is what we invested. So, when we did that, I got a loss of 3.33 crores and my net gain became 2.13 and the tax payable was only 56 lakhs this year. So, 1.56, instead of paying 1.56 crores of taxes, I pay only 56 lakhs now, I still have the money and then after one year I sell the, these shares at the same price, I get a 43 lakhs in the tax. Net tax is 99 lakhs, even here 1.5 to 99, I still save around 56 lakhs, I have saved for it. But 57 lakhs is my saving and then I looked at a 4% hedging cost and then opportunity cost of 5% I am still left with 27 lakhs of profit which roughly works out to 5%. I made a 5% tax saving because of this. And then I say it doesn't allow us but if we can charge 5% of that our fees levels can go up actually. Okay. And of course if some people say that no I don't want to hedge, I know the market, I am ready to take the risk. If there is no hedging the cost goes to uh, 40 lakhs is the benefit which is a 8-7% saving. So this is called the bonus tripping. No. Can be done but when you are doing it ensure that the tax saving benefit from this is less than 3 crores of rupees. Because anything above 3 crores, GAR comes in. And GAR says if you have done a transaction just for the purpose of taxes, it is there. Unless until you have somebody who keeps on buying these kind of shares, bonus shares, etc. You are in that line. Just for this, if you have gone and bought it and say under GAR, you are going to get hit. So plan that your tax savings from this should be less than 3 crores. Is this clear? that suppose I have a gain and then 
my I try to look out for tax harvesting, basically loss harvesting the losses, and I find out nothing is there. I don't stop there. I find out you know wife's name or somebody else's name in the family is there any stock which is low. Then we say that okay, they they have got a loss and I want a gain. I want to set it off. One way is I transfer this my shares to my wife, and then my wife sells off the shares. And she has got a gain now, and there's a loss. Can I check it off? Can I check it off? There's a gain in my wife's name because I have transferred the shares to her. There's a gain and there's a loss. Can she check it off? No. There's a clubbing provision. That income comes back to me. Therefore, I cannot check it off. Or can my wife sell, transfer those shares to me, and then can I do it? No. Again. The loss goes back there. It's not possible. So what I do is I transfer to my father, my wife also to my father, and there's no clubbing provisions there, and there to get a clean strike off. So this is how you need to keep looking at it and then do the planning for it. Uh, this is very interesting that we came across. This is something very very interesting. It was a shocker for us, and uh, we learn from our mistakes or not mistakes. Our uh, there was a case. Where a person sold his shares in foreign currency, Indian amount was in dollars. He sold it, and when we computed it, he had to pay tax, additional five lakh of taxes than what he was supposed to have paid on it. That was the case that was for us. But we learned from that. Next transaction when we did. We saved four crore of taxes using the same rules. Let me just explain to you how this works. These are all cases which is done, taken legal opinions, and then we have it with us. So of course it is, may not have gone through the assessment. Some of it, some have gone through the assessment, some no. Let me just show you this interesting case. So transaction was done on 14th of January. It was done. 45,000 shares were sold, and in USD it was at what uh, 4.95 crores of uh, USD. And then that came into my bank account, and my bank account gave me um, 35 crore. Uh, I don't know, it's 350 crore, right? Sorry for the numbers. I'm very weak in numbers. So, so this 350 crore that was there, and the uh, consideration was 350 crores is what it is. So, looking at this number, on what should be my sale consideration? It should be the amount that is shown what came to my bank account, right? That is the amount. But do not forget there are certain rules in income tax which you are required to follow. When they say that when you are receiving any income in foreign currency. The way you have to calculate the foreign exchange. There's a rule for it. It is not just the amount that comes into my bank account. There's a rule for it called 115. 115 says if the transaction has happened on 14th of January, then convert the dollar into the rate as on 31st of December. That's the last day of the previous month. You convert it. On that day, for my luck, the dollar price was 69.1. And since the transaction was huge, I got a difference of 7.96 crores is the reduction in consideration. So I <laughs> calculated my consideration. I took 7.8 crore, which is 8 crore less than the actual money I received in my bank account. I took that as the starting point, and then reduced my cost, and then paid the taxes on capital gains. Now question is, hey, how is it? Is it not cheating? You have got eight crore more, but you are not paying the taxes. Uh, law is law. I need to follow the law. When the other case, I paid five lakhs more. That was the law. Here, I am getting a. In fact, this transaction actually resulted in a four crore of tax benefit for the clients what we did for. And then the reason is then what is this amount? Now, whatever this amount, what I got, is it not for the sale of share? Is it? I was looking at this is amount of fifty six. For fifty six, I should have got any money. For other than for a consideration, what was 
This is not for other than consideration. I sold shares and they gave me the value of the shares. So it is not coming under 56. It is not coming under 56, it is not income from other sources. Where does it get taxed? The only way it is capital gains. Because it is for a sale of shares. It is a capital receipt which is non taxable. So this is possible. Yes. I am worried. Next round of transaction will be so huge. When they are going to do it, if, if the reverse happens, then I still have to face it. So some things are very interesting. So, but we here, the whole thing is. We lost 5 lakh of rupees in one transaction, but we remembered the rules, we made a checklist after that. You do it, in this kind of cases, this is what you need to do it. And that checklist helped us to gain 4 crores for a particular client. So, is this clear? Sell their shares, 
or they sell off their lease stocks and then make a lot of money. And uh, till that time, they would have had small houses. But when you make 10 crore, 20 crore, then you want to move to a bigger house. So how do you plan for the taxes? Different ways. Uh, first, we tell them that if at then already an apartment is under construction apartment is happening, normally when you go for an apartment, always look at it, you will be signing to sale agreement under construction agreement. That is how apartments are sold in Bangalore. So that means it's a construction. For 54F, you have a purchase and a construction. Two years for purchase, three years for construction. So it's very clear. Purchase at least it is, I can go one year back. Construction is only forward. So when I'm selling some, when there is a apartment is buying it, we clearly tell him very clearly, before you take possession, sell off your shares. Because after you take possession, sell the shares, it's a concession agreement, you cannot go back and use that one year rule. So first sell the shares and then take the possession. Tell the developer, don't give me possession. It's even if you're ready, don't give me possession. You tell them, complete the share share and then go the possession. That is one uh, golden rule you need to follow. And we know that when we are selling the shares, we should not have more than one house. And another house you can invest. We cannot have two houses. Most of the times they would have had one house, some small house they would have bought already. And father's house would have been inherited. They might have two houses. What do you do in those cases? This money what's coming in, he really wants to buy a bungalow. And then because he has got two small houses, he should not lose the benefit of a big one. So therefore, when we are talking to him, it's a, before the sale happens, you tell him, uh, before the sale of shares, sell off one property. The smaller property which you don't want it, sell it off. Then you come and follow the rule. See, whatever we do, we follow the rule. We give the benefit, but we follow the rule 100%. So sell it off and then do that. We can gift also. That's you can gift way. also. Instead of selling it, you can gift also. To whom should we gift? There's a property is there, whom do we gift? Can I gift it to my wife? Can I gift it to my spouse? Yes. I'll have one property, I've gifted already, right? So what will happen? I'm selling the shares, two properties I have, I'll sell it to my, gift it to my spouse. What will happen? We did this transaction, they can't realize this was a goof up what we have done. Basically when section, there's a section called 26, which talks about if I gifted my share to my spouse, I continue to be the owner of that property. Uh, so therefore, and when you go to 54F and all, it links to house property. So therefore, I still continue to be holding two. Luckily, in my case, a single officer did not know about it. We sell two. But actually, it's a mistake. So you should not gift it to spouse. You should gift it to father, mother, son. That is what you can do that. Other one is that I have already got two houses. I don't want to sell anything. But again, we want to invest. So that time what we do is, we give the share itself before the sale. Sell, give the shares itself. I give to, again now whom do I give to? Should I give to my wife or to my father? This would be my father, no clubbing. But even if I gift it to my wife, no problem. Because what gets club is my income from that transaction. She sells it, she invests in a house property, claim 54F, under all under one, the income from that transaction is after 54F and only that gets plumped into me and not the gas amount. Loss was different but in a 54F I can still give it to my wife and then she can sell it. Preferably to my father or where there is no clubbing option but here we can do this and then take that. And also what we tell people is that when normally when they are starting up, when they are startups and we know when the startup is really going to go off. Out of 10 startups, 4 really goes off. 6? We don't know. So we tell all the 10, when you are investing in the startup, what they invest is only 1 lakh, 2 lakh of rupees. Wife also will have one. If 2 lakhs is being invested, wife also will have her own money of 1 lakh. Tell them, both of you invest 1 lakh, 1 lakh you invest. Because tomorrow, when this grows to 20 crores, you will get 10 crore gain and she will get 10 crore gain and both of you can buy your own palaces and bungalows and get the tax benefits. So we advise them right when, when they start up, when they are not even seen the money, when they want to look at 2 lakh of rupees, when they can't even pay my fees, I still advise them, you, this is the way you have to do the investment and then do the transaction. And tell them at that point of time, when you make the money, you will pay my fees. <laughs> Don't forget that. Uh, many times we borrow money to acquire shares. You know when we borrow money to acquire shares, say suppose there is a company X, 
and they want a company Y. They borrow money and buy Y. Is it good? The interest portion of it, you know, when I have bought a company, the interest portion is not allowed. Of course, I do some arguments saying that since it is my business investment, therefore you have to allow it, but they will say 14 year discussion, disallowance, and all that will happen. So we still go, company X will borrow money and then buy company Y. And after that, we merge company X and Y. So now X has got a loan and no investment. And for what it was used for? It's for purpose of business. So therefore, the interest is allowed as a reduction. These are called the <coughs> leveraged buyouts. At the same time, we also, sometimes we also do that when we are doing the bonus tripping. See, in this particular case, I showed 5.5 crores he got and then he did that. I, when I spoke about this to one of my clients, he was so impressed by it. He said, Vivek, okay, we'll do it. Next day morning, he went, spoke to a financier and he's borrowing money to do that because more money he invests, more the loss he makes. He borrowed money to invest. Since he was borrowing money, I said, I can't give you the deduction for that. So therefore, we created a portfolio among him. He already had some shares. So we started buying, apart from this transaction, we started buying and selling a lot of shares. We borrowed more money and then actually created a share trading business for a period of two years. And this entire, we got the bonus shipping one and we also got the uh, interest uh, out for it. So basically we used that, somebody was talking about that's a circular for shares. Whatever was there in the share circular, we followed it and then made it as a uh, business and then bought it. Quite a lot of challenges on this 56 7B uh, angel tax. Uh, you are all hearing that when our startup is coming, they have only an Excel and an idea, and then they say that uh, started a business with 2 lakhs. After 3 months, you will say, My value of the company is 10 crore. What is it? Because I have an idea which is fantastic. <laughs> he comes to me and then shows an Excel sheet also. I say, You know, I can create an Excel sheet. What is that? But these guys really know that. There are disruption technology, you know that. Somebody has invested 10 crore valuation, 20 crore they invest. But me as a child accountant or a business consultant, I'm not so much used to it. When I do a projection and all, I still do it half-hearted. How is it possible 20 crore valuation? I would have still done a valuation and then given it to him. He would have got 20 crore based on my valuation. It goes to the tax authority. Tax authority says, uh, he would have projected year 2, 10 crore revenue. Year 2, actually it is 10 lakh revenue. Tax authority is 2 or 3 years on the line. You said 10 crore, it is 10 lakhs. That means the valuation what you have done is wrong. They are not documented properly and he is assessed with a 56 to uh, 56.7b. He will add it and then that income what cap share capital what he has to pay taxes on that. So this is very much a sad story for the startups. Of course, today we have, I can go and get registration under Startup India, file form to declarations. Form to declare very simple actually. Till the time we do it, no, it's something big. 15 minutes to fill up a form and then one declaration. Declaration says, whatever money I got, I cannot go and buy a car for myself. I cannot go and buy a house for myself. I cannot give advance money to my relatives for whatever they want to. I cannot do uh, non-business investments. These are the only thing which Normally, if you are actually doing business, you will not do any of that. If you file this, then there is an exemption from this angel tax. But for those people, sometimes the business doesn't fit into it. Then you need to, most of it, we can, if you are little creative, little thinking, you can make all business fit into it. For those people who, who are creativity doesn't work nothing, then you need to be careful on the what kind of instrument. So we say that rather than uh, taking equity, we tell them take convertible preference shares. Why? And if you allot preference shares at par. See, basically if you allot preference shares at par, the percentage of shares that fellow gets, the investor will be much more than the promoter. So it is not worth. So, but we said take up preference shares at par, conversion ratio is less. 10 is to 1 conversion ratio, you do that. In that case what we are doing, the moment I am taking the issuing shares at par, I don't fall under 56. 70. I achieved my purpose. At the same time, the cost for me is the highest stamp duty cost payable to the ROC. Compute that. If that is fine, go ahead with it. So that's fine. Other one is we go for convertible debentures. Not even different shares, a lot convertible debentures. It's a loan, convert equity. And when I convert the debenture into 
equity at that time I do the valuation and I am assuming that two years down the line the valuations I can get is much more stronger than the valuations I can get there. So we use that. However, also one we need to be little careful about is that what I understand is uh, this 5610 which has come which is a new animal very really dangerous. Uh, 5610 says whenever I receive any equity or anything it should be at a fair value. If it is more than fair value our tax is sure. And they give exceptions for many things which are not transfer. But there are 47 also talks about multiple things which are not treated as transfer but 5610 doesn't give you that benefit. One of that is conversion of preference shares into equity. It is not a transfer but 5610 doesn't give the exemption. One way I can say is that <coughs> where the receipt, I am the person, same person getting it. I have not received from anybody. My preference shares, my equity shares only. Name only change, that's all. Rama has become Shama. Therefore it is not there. But still we should be careful upon it, but it can be litigation. So take that, keep the mind advice, this is possible, but it can be litigation. At the high court level or Supreme Court level, you can win the cases. And when you are getting valuation reports, of course, no charter bonds cannot do it, but even if the merchant banker do it, please, charter bonds and give a valuation certificate for preference shares, please remember. Only for equity shares, DCF, you cannot give valuation certificate. For preference shares, you can still give valuation certificate. That's very, remember that. Yeah, okay. If it's a net asset value, no certificate required at all. So, when you're obtaining this valuation support, please get it done from a person who knows valuation thoroughly. The documentation that he knows, he has to have judicial decision to support it. Tomorrow when he's called and to, they have been grilled, they have been grilled for one day for a valuation. And they have been grilled two days at the, C, at the ED level, at the CBA level for investigations, I have been grinned for my valuations. Luckily, I have come out of it. But this can happen. So, when you take the valuation report, take it from a person who knows valuation, suppose, so that even when they grill, he can come out strongly. Because if he is not able to come out strongly, then your case is gone. Okay. Um, the challenges on uh, 50 CA and 56 10, there are quite a lot of challenges when you look into financial instruments, quite a lot of challenges are there. Uh, people were forming ESOP trusts uh, for giving to ESOP, ESOP trust, you transfer the shares for the ESOP trust. When you do it, please remember what are the implications. 50 CA luckily says that for 50 CA, all transfers which is not done for the fair market value it is there because ESOP trust when you are transferring the share value is 5000 but when you transfer to the trust you collect only 100 rupees only because it is for the employees to get but on the book value whether 50 CA is applicable examination is it is for there should be a transfer and under 47 transfer to an ESOP trust is not a transfer so there is an exception therefore 50 CA goes out but 56 does not give you this exemption 5610 doesn't give the exemption, so the East of Trust may have to pay the taxes. So do not advise companies whose the share value is pretty big or the book value is pretty big. Do not advise them to go for an East of Trust. They can just go for an East of Scheme and do it, not a East of Trust. If at all if you want to do it, then you can look at the partnership way instead of a trust. As you are talking about in the partnership also, there is an issue about 45. 3 versus 50 CA versus 56, those things are still there and he has already explained about those decisions. With that risk, you can put it into a partnership. If it is very few management employees, that is what it is. Or people want to give shares to consultant, like ESOP for consultants. Uh, so, in those cases, we need to get that. So, most of, we go for our fees, so many times for startups, we say, give me equity. In those cases, we put a partnership firm and they transfer it there. Then after we perform and everything, we get a share. <coughs> to a partnership form, it can be done rather than to a trust. Oh, so it is. And as I explained to you, there is this issue about the uh, 50 CA. When there is a lot of preferred shares than equity shares, 50 CA can be there. I will just show you one example as to how the how how difficult things can be.
just taking you through the small example. Uh, this is how the July 31, 2019 balance sheet is there. They bought 2,54,000 equity shares and 6,79 and their net worth is uh, 8, 820 million is their net worth. Now, if you actually look at it, what is, that is our net worth, that means let us take book value. If I, I assets also as that, book value on fully diluted basis, that is assuming preference shares converted 1 is to 1, the book value per share is 879. But the way the formula is done, you have to divide 820 million only by 254 and not 933. When you do that, the book value comes to 3217. In this particular case, the sale price was 2250. The actual sale price for equity was 2250. But on 967 rupees extra, this person has to pay taxes on it, which actually works out to pretty high of 6.88 crores additional taxes he has to pay just because of this. The only and even the buyer 56 is applicable and even he has to pay 30% tax on it. So in a matter like this, you need to sit down not just with the seller, the buyer, the company. In this particular case, what I will be, my client was only one small seller. That's all. Out of that many shares, 35% was my client's share. But still I had the courage and told that I need to talk to the company guys and talk to the buyer and told them that, see it is good for you because they were buying 100% of the company. The buyer was buying 100%. I said, whether it's equity or preference, does it matter for you? I said, doesn't matter. Then convert this into equity and then you do the buyer. Because conversion of preference shares to equity, there is no tax, still long term, still continuous, everything is there. And then do the buyout. So if this fellow also will save tax, you also will save tax. And they accepted it and even the buyer company has become my client. So, so because we saw that benefit was this, they are able to get it. So that is how we need to look at it. So this is where 50 CA can be really very scary. <coughs> And we have tra shares transfers like uh, say three promoters and uh, one promoter is exiting. And uh, one promoter is exiting but he has got shares both, uh, we call, when the promoters get shares, no, first of all they would have been allotted. Suppose he has got 33,000 shares, they have been allotted, the entire shares, but they will tell him that when he, if he leaves the company every one year he will get 11,000 shares. If he leaves the company after uh, one year, then 22,000 shares, he has to give it away at nothing and what value he can get is only for 11,000 shares. So something like this was happening. He had to leave. The company had grown but his entitlement was only for 11,000 shares. The other 22,000 shares, he had to sell it at pittance value. But the 50 CA value was very high. So what do you do? He is getting stuck there. So what the solution that what we came out of a lot of things is that Instead of that fellow 22,000 shares, he should not get, that's all right. That is the whole thing. 22,000 shares, he should not get it. That 22,000 shares should go to the other promoter. So what we did, on one hand, we did a buyback of 22,000 shares, where I don't have a CA value, and then did the rights issue of 22,000 shares to the other promoters and balanced it out. Of course, on the rights issue, there's one case called Sudhir Banan case, which protects me, but I do not know whether there's a protection from the 56, 7. But we have resolved it. So this is how you can use buybacks whenever these kind of things happen. You can use uh, buyback also rather than 50, uh, 50 CA, 56. You can use buybacks and then look at that. Um, because 50 CA and 56 are very harsh. On one hand for the seller there is additional tax. For the buyer also it is isn't tax. It is a double tax that happens. So you should be very careful on uh, these matters. You need to be very, very careful. So I think I have done with my presentation, now it's around 8 o'clock. Uh, just to give you some bit on valuation, I have just captured it here. Just to tell you that even a chart accountant can still continue doing valuation if it's a preferred shares. If the transaction is happening at net asset value, then you don't require a valuation certificate at all. And only when you are doing equity shares on a DCF basis, that is the time when you have to go for a merchant banker. Otherwise, still a chart accountant can still give a valuation, so you can give that.
we also do some investment uh, restructuring. Uh, I, I think I have got few more slides. Sir, up to what time, sir? 50. 50. 50. Okay. I not take 15, but I will just. We also do some investment restructuring has to be done, not only just for selling it. Uh, especially family business that would be there. Say, two brothers, let's take an example, simple two brothers and both of them hold shares in say one real estate business and another in a uh, hotel business. And then decide that A will have real estate and B will have hotel business. Now if you transfer the shares, difficult. And brothers, I'm just using brothers very common, but they may not be relative as per the definition. So basically it is cousin, it will come down, you know, uncle and it comes down. So fifth generation, you are not brother, you are a cousin, but managing the business. And you want to, do, but you are a family of a larger family. You want to swap the shares, then there can be huge capital gains impact because of 50 CA. But what's happening is just rearranging the shares. Uh, so what do you do? There's something called a family arrangement. Basically, why is being done? Basically, to avoid future disputes. Law recognizes that if you do this interchange of swapping of assets under a family arrangement, then even if you're not a relative, under family arrangement, can happen. And even under, even if your brothers don't do a swapping, because gift is different. Swapping is actually one you are exchanging one asset to the other. There can be a capital gain on it. Both the brothers will pay capital gains. So, but in a family arrangement, <coughs> the concentration is peace of the family. That is what the concentration is. You do family arrangements, but please use the chart accountant as well as the advocate attend to that. Then it can be done a tax efficient way. But sometimes what happens in this case where the brothers or the individuals hold those shares in both the companies, it's possible to do a family arrangement. Sometimes what happens, everybody holds the shares in one holding company. And holding company invests in two operating companies. And now, these two operating companies have to go to a group A shareholders and group B shareholders. Then what do you do? That becomes a pretty messy. Uh, one option is do a family arrangement and do the way family arrangement is done, little complex method, possible, uh, but very complex. The other method is something simple that what we had thought about is, we said let us demerge these two companies and then on demerger the shares get allotted to the shareholders and then the shareholders do a family arrangement. You can do that. But when you want to demerge it, the problems of demerger are very strange. It's a holding company having two operating companies. What you can demerge is only a business can be demerged. Just an investment cannot be demerged. So how do you come for it? So we have just See, basically this things, our chairman is there and he has given the name Vipat Sabha. I have been totally open and transparent with all of you guys as to what we have been doing it. Uh, these are the consulting opportunities. It is there. Just out of box thinking. And we say that let the knowledge flow. Uh, these are all actually an IP for us. If it was not for this session, somebody started going to come and sit with me, I will not give all this. Uh, I will definitely not give it because it's an IP which we have worked for it for ages. We have worked for it. Uh, let's give you one more structure which we have done that. <coughs> in this, there is a private limited company. They have got two investments. One in ABC <coughs> business, which is this one to private limited, that's a business. And they have a real estate in that. Now real estate has to go to one group. Or a, this one to three private limited has to go to one group. And there's a family shareholding that is there. I cannot do any demerger because if I want to, in, uh, I want to uh, by demerger I want to take out one, two, three private limited outside. Demerger says only a business undertaking has to be done. So what we did was, so basically the way solutions are there, you go identify what is causing the problem. Don't look at too much anything. When you are looking at it, consult a person. An expert will consult, but you can come with a solution. Let there be a tax expert or somebody. But I can bet you, you need not be a tax expert or anything, but you can understand the problem and do that. Here what it was, somebody told me, if it is not having a business, you cannot transfer it. A business should be carried on. Right for it. So I said, okay, business should be carried on. Let me create a business in this. So what we did, we created a new auto component business into this company and this S private limited, that's one to three private limited is in auto components. And we said that we ran this auto component business 
in the main company for one year and we did lot of transactions in the auto component and the subsidiary and now it is part and parcel. Now when I do demerge and demerging the business of auto component which has an investment in another auto component company, I demerge and I get two companies and then I do the swap of shares. So basically just look at what the problem is, where the problem is and, and go to the root. You fix the root that what it is. Like doctors what do they do? They diagnose the problem and see that that problem goes off. That's all the solution should be that. And after that tax and all is just uh, coincident into it. That's the whole thing. So there's another structure that we have uh, worked upon and got it. Is that clear sir? So demerger is what we, one of the structures that we have used. A uh, lot of times uh, we need, when we are advising US citizens, a lot of people are now in, uh, we can't even make out all names of Vivek, Shuram, but these are the names that are there, but they can be a US passport holder. So, and when it's a US passport holder, they might be staying in India, but because they are US passport holder, they are taxable globally in that country also. So when you are advising US, especially a lot of things you need to be knowing there. And the reason I'm taking US is, every country has got its own thing, but most of the people whom we meet have, come, have returned back from US or US they have invested. What do you look at in those cases? Because their global income is taxable. When you advise them, suppose a US person is coming and telling you, I am selling this shares in India. First question, let us not say then invest in a house property. We say invest in a house property, it is tax free. Yes, it is tax free. In India it is tax free. He earned in India and not paid any tax in India. There in US he offers it for tax and pays tax at 15% there. Actually the Indian government should have got to pay taxes. And when you are getting a tax free, because it is tax free there is no tax credit also. He will pay the taxes there. Instead of that, what we tell him is that money, there I show my patriotism, I tell him pay the taxes in India, instead of 20%, let us plan such a way that only 15% tax is payable in India on this transaction. The investment what we do is only lesser, so I get 15% tax and then the same income is declared there in US as taxes where the tax is 15% and take the credit for the tax paid here in India, there in US. At least our country gets the taxes and he also is not worse off. He for him it is the same 15% what you would have paid. Okay. And uh, in this way it is. And important is that many times what we also suggest to them when they have got shares and more property, we tell them that instead of if the north is then selling it, there is a withholding tax of 20% that has to be done. And then uh, here the tax rates are pretty high, sometimes the tax rates are pretty high, then they would be at a tax rate in the US. They can move up to 37% tax rates that are there. So we tell them you transfer those assets to your father or mother and then after they do it, they can sell it and it is taxed in their hands, it is not reportable in US. But at the same time, please remember, in US, like we have tax on gift, person receiving gift, then in US, not a person receiving gift has to pay tax, person giving gift has to pay tax. No, no, given gift tax, inheritance <coughs> tax is next. When I have to give gift, for me every year, 15,000 dollars is my limit for gift. If anything above 15,000 I give gift, I need to pay tax. So if I give this gift, there is a problem. Then there is something called a, some 11 million dollars lifetime limit for gift is there. I make use of the 11 million dollar scheme and then show this gift and then in this US tax returns I need to tick off again the 11 million and given this gift. If I have not done that, he pays gift tax. So I need to advise him even on that. That also needs to be taken care of. And whenever a non-resident selling the tax rate is 10%, not 20%. Now I always have this confusion. Whenever a non-resident comes, I will say 20% tax. My junior will immediately say, no sir, 10%. I don't worry, I don't remember that, I do not know, but 
that is the the law is it is 10% tax, not what I know. And uh, sometimes what we have seen is it's very important is that when a non-resident suppose we had a case where a person in Sweden sold the shares of a U.S. company, money came to Indian bank. First question for us was nothing to do with India. Sweden, a person, resident of Sweden, sold shares of US. It is not taxable. But unfortunately, Indian tax law says any money received in India, you have to pay tax. Income received in India, you have to pay tax in India. Nothing to do with India. So this was a very, very difficult situation. So in these cases, you should ensure that, and I cannot use which treaty I should use. Sweden India treaty, US India treaty, Sweden US treaty. There is this confusion that happens. So, this what, so therefore then we started advising that no, no, you should get the money directly in Sweden, don't bring it to India. Even if you want it, first get it go to Sweden or any other country and then you want to bring the money to India. In this particular case, luckily what we figured out was that this money first when he sells those shares, it goes to his broker's account. <coughs> and then broker gives it to India. And we said broker's account is my account, agent's account. So the first receipt is in India. Law says after the income is received in other country and then repatriated to India, that is not income. So we took that benefit and then said that it is not taxable. So these things we need to be very very careful about how international transactions happen. And uh, when people come to India, non-residents, they are all there, they want to return back. First thing is somebody will come, an elderly person will come and tell you, my son or daughter wants to come back, what should he be doing? He is coming back, you have told him, he just telling him, he wants to come back, do you know a very good house? Then you tell him, I don't know house, but I can tell him what are the tax treatments he has to do. Because after he comes to India, after two years, he becomes a regular resident. Then worldwide income gets taxed here in India. Then what do we do that? Therefore, we, what we do is, we get into what all the assets they have with them. All of them are financial instruments. They get into it and identify each other financial instruments and sometimes you tell them, Sell off the shares now, buy the same shares. Apple shares he bought long time back. You tell him sell the Apple shares, pay the taxes in US now and rebuy the Apple shares. Then my reset the value has happened, that is fine. But again, there is a tax outflow. Sometimes what happens, there was something called retirement funds. US, there is a retirement called 401k IRA. In that, the way it works is, from that fund, it is like a fund, it is like a bank account. From that fund, they can invest in Apple, Google, any share they can invest, they can decide which one to do, they can put in 50 deposit, everything they can do it. As long as within that basket, any income that is coming is not liable for tax in US. That is the US law. And only when you withdraw from that basket to regular basket, there is a tax. But when India doesn't know that basket, we don't have a basket concept. It is your money, you have sold the shares, it came into that basket, you pay taxes. So therefore it becomes a challenge. In US it is not taxed, in India it is taxed. And in India it is taxed today, I pay the taxes. This year the credit is not available in US because US there is no tax on it. US it is taxed after 59 and a half years when he receives the money back. So there is a mismatch. So that time you tell them before you come, all the 401k, all those amounts, whatever that is there, anyway it is not taxable even if you sell it, Apple share you sell it, liquidate it and then put it in a growth fund. Growth fund means Capital appreciation keeps on happening. Up to 59.5 years, let the appreciation happen. After that, you sell it, we will also tax here and take the credit. At least we are matching the credits at that point of time. So, these are the kind of discussions you need to have with people who are coming into India. Uh, what about people going out of India? That time also we need to plan out for that. So, people going out of India because they become taxation, US reporting are there, etc. So, we tell them to gift it to their parents. And then when we gift it to the parents, very important is not just look at the gift uh, issue, also see that the will is done, that their parents will talk about this particular person, the property should come to, that uh, this instrument should come to. Then or we create a trust, a family trust, not charitable trust, a private trust, and then we put the shares into that, and then see after that it is managed, etc. So that is much easier for a non-resident to manage shares in a family trust rather than in the individual name. So these are the few things that we need to keep looking at it and then work upon for the various categories of uh, investments. So this can be done for investments, main uh, financial instrument, but also can be done for properties, etc. That is there. 
So this is brief what all I can remember for the last one year work what we are able to do which was remained in my mind so what it is. Later on I realized that I don't think we have a logbook of what all the solutions we have given. How good it would have been if we had a logbook I could have definitely shared much more for you. Sorry there was more you done but I don't remember which I am not able to share with you guys. So I hope that uh, my sharing with you was pretty interesting and the good thing is that I am not a tax guy. I am not at all a tax guy. I do not know the tax provisions. I do not know the tax law. Anything that is required, I need to call my guy. They will take me. But I can think, I can think passionately for my client. I understand his problem and then we come out with these solutions. We just keep exploring it. As I told you, as a business capitalist, take an idea and do it. The best way for you people to really become as consultant, you want to do it. Just every day you have to play this game for creativity. You take this mic. What will this mic do? Obvious answer is I talk with cluster. Instead of that, you think about 10 things. What? Not this function. Okay. I will use this as a walking stick. I will use this for cleaning cobwebs. I can keep thinking 10 items. What you can do with this mic? So every time, day, take up one item. Think. Rather than obvious, what all can be done? Just play this game. Keep playing this game. I am telling you, you as a chartered accountant will become prudent. And whenever we are being creative, we are going to be creative within the four corners of law. There are a lot of things within the law which can give you the benefit. No need of unaccounted transactions at all. I, there are no, no any unaccounted, never, nobody comes. I don't have a client who has got a search case at all. So I don't know them. So, but these are the matters that come. Yes, there is a litigation challenge that will be there. It will be there, but it's an interesting game. Being in this profession is a very interesting game. We really enjoy it if we are being creative and all. Thank you.